I'm just going to move closer to it. Huh? Okay. That's not really working. Yeah. But anyway, I'm going to talk about so you can hear me. Um, you know, truthfully, in this book that's going to come up afterwards, she's going to talk more in detail. But I'm just going to talk Lauren Lon Fitcher because I've worked with so many of you over a period of time. I've never met the general manager. But, um, but I have worked with followers here. And I, I, 2005, when I was a bar chapter president, we negotiated with then director Keller as the bar board president. We negotiated un under very hard times. We had had the dot com bus. We had underfunded retirement medical. I say we because there was a joint committee and neither the unions nor uh, the administration management took responsibility to make sure that, that our medical retirement was properly funded. Um, and so we had huge challenges in 2005, and yet we were able to resolve them without any disruption to the, to, to the service that we provide to our community. And now that I honestly can tell you the challenges are not as tough, they're just not there. We are in this situation where I have been to the table, and I honestly can tell you that the representatives of the board who are bargaining on your behalf have no intention to reach an agreement, a fair negotiable agreement. They have created this crisis. This crisis that we're looking at on Monday has been created by your administrators. And this, this to me is shocking, because I, I've worked with Tom Hargrove, I've worked with Paul Oversee, in fact, Paul Oversee was at the table in 2005. And have we seen eye to eye? Probably not on a lot of things, but we were able to resolve problems. And you know, that's what we do as workers here at BART. We constantly resolve problems. We work to make sure that the system is safe, it's reliable, that it serves the patrons, and that it functions as an economic vein of our community in our Bay Area. So my concern is really what's happening at BART. I, the administration that's reflecting you, that's working on your behalf, has created, has polarized the workforce. That, I mean, a thousand forty-five people voted at BART. Never. People came from vacation, the Vice President of Bart was telling us, took a short vacation to come to vote. A thousand four people voted to go on a strike. That tells me their anger is unprecedented. So unless the, the administrators are willing to either come to the table themselves, let's face it, they hired a person to negotiate the contract who took us out on a strike in 1997. We brought Josie to the table. Because Josie was part of 2005, she's been part of many contracts throughout the Bay Area. She helped us in San Francisco. She bargains on, on behalf of the membership and she gets to good agreements. You guys, your administrators, bring someone who took us out on strike in 1997 and reward them by giving them a contract now to come back to bargain with us. And I have to tell you, if I was in your seats and somebody had taken this workforce out on strike in 1997 because they were unable to reach agreement, they would have never been hired again. Yeah. There are a lot of our board uh, members that I unfortunately have not met, and I apologize. I wanted to reach out to all of you. Uh, but there are several of you who I've worked with during tough times when we did creative agreements. We, we, we dealt with the elevator escalator. We built that whole you know, a back to work program. We did it with the clericals and we did the, you know, the incentive programs. So don't tell me there aren't ways to resolve these problems that we're facing today. You have to look at your general manager and you have to ask her, why have we not been able to reach an agreement? Because I have to tell you, at the end of the day, if I was making $315,000 a year with a benefit package, the general manager has, I would obligate myself to do one thing, if nothing else, and that's continue to have labor harmony, to continue to have these trains running, right. and to reach a good labor agreement. Yeah. That's, that's the right. bare minimum. Thank you. Hi, I'm Josie Mooney. I know also know many of you, and I appreciate the introduction by my president, Roxanne Sanchez. I'm a retired member of SEIU 10 to 1. And as you know, I've been a longtime labor leader and activist and member in the Bay Area. I have negotiated literally hundreds of contracts. And I am here to tell you that this is the worst experience that we have ever had. That's right. Not just here at Barnum. 
So that's saying something when you've been doing this work as long as I've been doing it. I just want to give you some examples. And I'm not trying to bargain in public, but I want to make sure that you understand the underlying issues of some of these proposals. By example, you are out there saying in the public that we pay $92 a month for our health insurance. What you've neglected to mention is that we also pay 1.67%. When you add those two things together, it's $200 a month for the average member, and it's 26% 26% of the employee only for Kaiser, and 30% for the employee only for Porat. So I want to know, when I read the blue card that you were passing out to passengers, that none of the information that you provided to the union under your legal obligation to give us the information request that we have demanded substantiates the information that you put on your card. One of your consultants did that. Never in my experience has the employer gone out and passed out cards with misinformation that cannot be substantiated by the numbers that you gave us. <laughs> Secondly, the economic proposal that you currently have on the table following five years of no increase, as you know, and $100 million in concessions in the last five years that these unions made, because we understood the economic circumstances at that time. If your current proposal, the one that we have in front of us right this moment, would mean that if I'm the average BART worker for SEIU, and it's similar for APU, I assume, making $33 an hour, that in four years from now, I will make $9,700 less than I do today. Now, I don't know how you would uh, expect that the union, in under any circumstance, could agree that after nine years, that a worker would make $9,700 less than they make today. It's not possible to agree to that. We would get precisely zero votes. <laughs> so it can't be ratified. We have to have an honest conversation about the impact of your decisions on ordinary working families, like the sister and her children, and everybody else here that you see that gets up in the morning and tries to make a living by doing the very best job they know how to keep the riding <laughs> that some people's lives are more important than others. So when we put a proposal on the table that says that everybody should get the same life insurance benefit, and it's arbitrarily and unilaterally uh, you know, disregarded, rejected by your team, you actually, in effect, say that if you're in management, your life is more valuable than if you're one of us. Mm -hmm. I don't know why people in management should get more vacation <laughs> than we get. <laughs> I don't know why when we work as hard as they do, I would venture to say harder than they do. <laughs> why we should be entitled to less vacation. So we make a proposal to have the same vacation and it's unilaterally rejected. I do not understand why someone who is in management should get a higher tuition reimbursement than someone who isn't. Isn't it true that we want the possibility of a promotional opportunities for the lowest wage workers, who, by the way, are the people who have been denied the benefit of tuition reimbursement? and who are also dominated by women and people of color. I do not understand how this board can look at these members and unilaterally say no. To, frankly, some of these proposals would be pennies on the dollar. But for an injured worker who is seeking a disability insurance increase, it could make all the difference 
And I know this personally because my sister had a stroke at age 50, and she's been permanently disabled ever since. And were it not for the reasonable disability insurance that she had from her employer, my sister would be bankrupt. So I want you to consider your position and how it feels to be on our end of the bargaining, facing people who you've hired, and I, I suppose we should be flattered that you thought it necessary to spend a million dollars to bargain against us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> bargaining that we're doing is quite surface bargaining. Mm -hmm. I will tell you honestly that your team has come in, and I'm not going to personalize it because it isn't personal. They obviously are either operating without authority or under instructions from you to not reach an agreement. Because if we continue tonight, and we're prepared to stay the whole night, then, and we don't have an agreement, then there will be a strike on Monday. We do not <coughs> want to strike. We want a fair and equitable agreement. And if that's the case for you, I would like you to stand up. Look them in the eye and come to the table yourself. Hmm. And let's make it a deal. Let's make it a deal. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening. I'm a 33 year veteran bus operator at AC Transit. Right. A member of ATU Local 192. We stand here, or I stand here, uh, in solidarity with brothers and sisters of ATU 1555 and SEIU 1021. We stand here in solidarity because we're going through the same struggles that Bart is going through, and they are trying to take away wages, benefits, and conditions that we have fought for for decades. We, as workers, are not the cause of the economic crisis that people have talked about. That economic crisis was caused by the banks and mortgage companies that speculated and risked our lives and our homes so they could get in immensely wealthy. Both BART and AC are trying to take away the wages and benefits of BART and AC workers, but they have no problem maintaining the profits of the healthcare industry. The fastest growing part of our contracts is, is healthcare benefits that have gone up from $300 for a family plan of health net in 1995 to $2,200 today. And who benefits from that? Is our healthcare better? Not necessarily. But the profits of the healthcare industry, so called healthcare industry, have gone through the roof. Richard Helmsley of United Healthcare recently got a pension package for himself of $1.7 billion for one man. That is what your policies continue to support. Right downstairs there's CVS Caremark, which is our drug provider. The CEO of CEO Caremark makes $460 million a year salary makes 456 times the average worker. That's the kind of, of inequality that you're promoting by your policies and continuing to make workers pay for an alleged crisis that is not a crisis for Mr. Helmsley. Right now, you spent over $500 million for a driverless train that will, will, will service no workers, I mean, hire no workers. When you could have spent $45 million for a dedicated bus rapid transit that could have hired dozens. 
but you've chosen to set up a plan where it's going to cost $12 round trip for people to get back and forth. And that is not something that benefits the working class. But the next speaker, Lakmin uh, Abegunis Akara. Good evening. Uh, my name is Lakmin Abegunis Akara. I'm a train operator. This is my sixth contract. I came yeah. to address you guys. You guys are the, supposed to be overseeing this system, not these people. You guys are supposed to tell these people what to do. And now we are at the 11th hour and talking about the financial mismanagement of this system. I'm not going to repeat what my brothers and sisters said, but I'm going to tell you some new things. Cable Yard, about three years ago, the whole yard ended up in flames. Right. It $11 million. Yeah. It was not done by one of my brothers and sisters. Right. It was done by a manager. All right. $100 million on the double ATC system. What do we have to prove today? Bunch of rusting, corroding antennas. <laughs> Nobody was held accountable for that. And let me talk about the 40th anniversary party that we had. <laughs> <laughs> do you guys know that we had two trains running up and down the system, two 10-car trains delivering Cupcake. At the three stations, they ran out of cupcakes. <laughs> but still the trains were running. And that evening, we did not have enough long trains for 500 and 100 runs. For passengers. This financial crisis is completely artificial. Last contract, we gave $100 million of concessions. Right. Look, six months later, we found $100 million, $60 million. Right. Where do you get your accountants? From Enron? Yes! <laughs>
I find myself in a position that I was in 11 years ago, speaking to many of you that are on the board, some of you that are new. But on January, on June 14, 2002, my brother died of cancer. And at that time, then General Manager Marco talked about how we were a family, because we were about to be laying off, or the district was about to lay off 22 part-time employees. And my brother was diagnosed in April and died six weeks later. He was 26 years old. And when I came back to the board meeting after burying him, I approached the board. I know Director Fang will remember this. And I said to the board then, if we are supposed to be a family, there's another way than to have to lay off 22 people. You have another way to get the money that you claim that you need. Well, today you have another way to get the money that you claim that you need. This is the Bark family. We get up every single day to do the work that we do, and we are proud of the work that we do. You can't have a 95% on time rating without a day in 2010 and in 2012 to my San Francisco Giants World Series Championship already. <laughs> Y'all know I'm a San Francisco Giants. Right? Gotta plug my team. But the fact is, to the Raiders games, to the 49ers games, I'm a Warrior fan, so to the Warriors, I mean, we do that work. We are, ba are Bart Strong and Bart Proud. We expect that you would do the same. The negotiations have been horrible. I have been here, this is my seventh contract. And it is very disappointing to have people sit across the table from me and glaze over on issues that are real. They're not fictional. They're not a, a smoke screen. When you have 2,446 people that have been assaulted out of five stations in three years, that's not fiction. When you have people that are sitting in this audience that have been hurt by train windows, cab doors, assaulted by a passenger and coworker as I have been. That's not fiction. I urge you to be responsible and direct staff to come to the table and take care of the people that you claim that are your family, that you claim make this system great. Because in one minute, you will praise us to the high heavens, and then the next minute, you will denigrate and demoralize us. I cannot believe that these people, these interns, or whoever they were, and paid them either $10 or $18 an hour to hand out cars that were totally misrepresentative of what we do and what we earn and how it's fixed. I told President Radulovich yesterday on the radio that somebody owes me some money. Because I don't make $11 million in overtime, or $11,000 in overtime annually, okay? And I, I resent the fact that that information was out there People are attacking our station agents. Yes. We can bargain a contract without doing this. We are not slamming anybody in the newspaper, but yet we are being slammed. These are the same Sam T Singer tactics that he used in 2009. Although this time, there was no one in front of a mic saying, go confront your, your station agent, your train operator, and ask them why they demand a good contract. This time, you put some innocent people that don't know what they're handing out. They just know they need some money because times are hard. And then the people turn. And they turn on the frontline workers that are out here trying to do a good job every single day. Shame on you. I don't know whose decision that was, but shame on you. I am proud to be, I've been here 22 years. I left Internal Revenue Service as a collection agent to come to BART and waited four years to go full time because the district would not promote but I stayed here when I had three years to go back and not only keep the pay I had, but get a raise and keep my seniority and everything. But I came here because I wanted to be a bar employee. I wanted to work here. And I wanted to be proud of the job that I did. And I still am. I am proud to be a station agent. I am proud to stand here representing the ATU family, that they had enough confidence in me to step to the plate to represent them. But I am not proud of the ability that I'm in, the job I'm able to do when I'm not getting anything in return. We cannot negotiate a contract by ourselves. People need to come through the table and come correct. They are not doing that. I urge you, I urge you, on behalf of every family member that is here, every child, every husband, every wife, every boyfriend, every girlfriend, everybody that is impacted by the job we do, every worker, every rider that rides this system, we care about them. We thought you did too. 
Hmm. Certainly the way that this is going, it's not indicative of it. We're not talking strike. The comments you made, Director Keller, were appalling to me. Hmm. I couldn't believe that you would say, let's go on strike in the summer. To me, the comment should have been, let's get to the table and get this contract resolved. Amen. Yeah. Amen. that is fair and equitable. We want health and safety provisions that are going to work for our members and the working public. Thank you.